Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Martha Booker Johnson, and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Derek Nurse. Derek was a professor at Memorial University and is now an emeritus professor. His research focuses on Bantu languages, especially those in East Africa, and on Tenzin aspect, both in Bantu and in Niger Congo more broadly. Please join me in welcoming Derek as he gives his talk, a proposed new East African clay lit, Langi Chaga Dawida Sagal. So, um, good evening or good morning, whatever. Uh, so, a proposed new historical grouping or cladlet, as we say, uh, Rift Valley Bantu, that's what we propose to call it. Uh, I would very much like to hear your reaction to this, uh, preferably uh, email, because I, if, it, if it has any merit, I would think of getting it published. So, whatever you have to say, please tell me. So, here's a wonderful map provided by um, Andrew. Uh, there are two, as you can see, uh, there are two, the two areas on the left, um, they uh, enclose that little house there, which is on Babati, it shouldn't be on Babati, uh, it's not Martin, it's not Andrew's fault, it's my fault, it should be on Kondoa, Kondoa, Kondoa region is where uh, Langi is spoken, up in the middle there, Mount Kilimanjaro, I took arbitrarily Moshi as the centre of the Chaga speaking area, and over on the right there, um, there's Wundanyi, that's the center of the largest um, elect, uh, Taita elect, and Usangi's North Pare. Okay. Uh, probably you're all very familiar with this. So the aim is to propose a new East African Bantu clade to be called Rift Valley um, Bantu. This involves uh, outlining historical linguistic features defining, first of all, Chaga, then Chaga plus Davida, which is a elect of uh, Taita, Chaga David and Sagala, the preceding plus Langi and maybe Bue, uh, same thing as Mbugwe, which I haven't examined systematically. These these four together to be tentatively labeled Rift Valley Bantu. Phillips and Molaik use the label Kilimanjaro to refer to just Chaga and Davida. I use it here also to include Sagala. Phillips is not here, so we can't object. If this proposed new clade is correct, it raises historical issues of timing and movement. Did the Langi uh, move, uh, move west, or did uh, the others move east, or did they all move there for third place back in the day? While the link Chaga Davida is fairly widely accepted, linguists have had trouble linking and classifying the others. Uh, Chaga, so Guthrie only placed Chaga in his zone E because he said, it would be less suitable to place it anywhere else, which isn't exactly a ringing endorsement. Um, yeah, uh, Guthrie placed David and Sagala together, but in recent decades, uh, doubts have been cast on this, preferring a Sagala link to Midji Kendi varieties along the coast, but no concrete evidence has ever been offered. The place of Langi is off has long been a puzzle. Marcelli and Nurse, there are others too, detached it from the rest of Zone F. Uh, Gromont et al. placed Langi as a single outsider to all other East African Bantu languages. Uh, and then there's a the last sentence which doesn't really belong with what's just been said. Koa Langi to Hunyani is about 350 kilometers in a straight line. Uh, Kondoa to Moshi is about 250, and Moshi to Hunyani is about 100 kilometers. Anticipated headwinds. Philipson is skeptical about including Sagala in this scenario. Uh, he inclines to believe the Sagala were late comers from the coast to the Taita Hills, initially occupied by Davida. Baus may have a different view of the origin of the Langi language. Current background, this is part of a wider project. The 50 years since Guthrie 1971 have seen several attempts to rearrange Guthrie's referential classification of East African Bantu to better reflect their historical development. All, all of these, or nearly all of them, have been based on assessments of lexical similarity. Lexico statistical or phylogenetic. Uh, Grolmont, Philipson, and myself are currently involved in producing a new picture, integrating lexical assessment and phonological, morphological features 
As part of this project, I've been examining most boundary lines east of a line from north central Uganda, so Bungu, southwest to include the J languages around Lake Victoria, southeast along Lake Tanganyika, corridor languages of southwestern Tanzania and Zambia, M and N languages, finally curving east to N10, P10, P20, with the sideways glance at P30 and S. In Hammerstrom 2019, ignoring P30 and S, this totals 165 languages, dialects, and lects. And uh, go down to the bottom first. Uh, this is the footnote. <laughs> uh, the E50 languages in J46, which is a member of uh, E, are each referred to normally as languages. The variants of Chaga are normally referred to as dialects. There's much more variation, especially consonantal in these so-called dialects than the E50 languages, as you can see by comparing those two pages there. If you want all this, I can send it to you later. Hence, occasionally here I use the neutral term lect. So back up to the top here, of the many phonological and fewer morphological features considered, only a few were found to be useful. Features widespread in East African Bantu are mostly not used as direct evidence, though they do play some role in the features chosen. So I've ignored Bantu frication, also called Bantu spiritization, Dal's law, fricative devoicing, loss of H, loss of gen or an addition of G, loss of L, change of 75 vowels, neutralization of vowel length, total phenomena, total phenomena, etc. Inadequate data also plays a role in some cases. So the following are found useful. Firstly, uh, what's uh, widely referred to as rhoticization. For those of you who don't know, probably nobody, uh, erotic is an R, or as we say in British English, an R. There was no R. Um, so D, Hodobantu D, which is widely interpreted as being a lateral, uh, change of R before high vowels, the two high vowels. This is the main plank of the RVB hypothesis considered. For example, Protobantu and Kuru uh, gives you in some Chaga dialects a guru. Wedi gives you either Mweri or Mori. In all Kilimanjaro lects, the types of R before the high front vowel differ from those before the high back vowel. Rhoticization should be considered in the framework of Brantufrication. Most, about 130 of the 165 languages examined, have undergone Brantufrication, whereby the non-nasal consonants of Petafrota Bantu fricated before the two high, super high, tense vowels, but not before the five other vowels, the lower vowels. There's local variation, but standard Swahili is typical uh, of many, for T and, v, T and D before the high vowels. So here's, uh, just look at the text at the bottom first. Uh, before the high front vowel, uh, Protobandu S, Z, or some similar fricative emerge, while F or V uh, similarly develop before the high back vowel. So there's the examples there. So on the left is Protobandu, on the right there's uh, standard Swahili. So Titimuka, I speak, as you see, Protobandu quite fluently. Titibuka, be startled, um, gives you in Swahili Sisimka. Uh, Tungo, Sivet Cat, gives you Fungo. Mbudi gives you Mbuzi. And Dedu gives you Ndevu. But for the lower vowels, I only illustrate one of them here. Tatu gives you Tatu. And Lala, uh, Dada gives you uh, Lala. But this is what happens with rhoticization. Uh, let me just read. Uh, the vowel is a bit at the bottom first. In the language under consideration, these typical fricatives did not emerge. Instead, erotic appears before the high vowels, contrasting with the lateral before the other vowels. So there you see Protobanzu on the left, um, Dangi, Jagger, Davida, Sagala. So Protobanzu, Mwedi, in Mwedi, in Dangi gives you Mwedi, in Jaga gives you Mwedi or Mori, depending on the dialect. Uh, Davida, Mori, and in, in, in Sagala Mwesi, you'd say, just a minute, what's that Z doing there? Never mind that, we'll come back to that. Um, uh, and Root gives you Ruta, Rura, Ruta, Ruda, Ruta. Uh, but on the other hand, Lala just gives you Lala, 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 Lala. Langi, Davide, Sagala, Gwen have just one R. Whereas Laga, uh, Chaga, Lex, and Kilimanjaro have multiple phonetic liquids and at least two phonemic rotics. Hence the use of gueno. It's much similar to use gueno uh, to exemplify chaga. 
hence the use of Guido above to exemplify Chagger. It makes sense to say that this romanticization is old. It proceeds Bantu spiritualization, Bantufrication. If Bantufrication had happened first, there'd have been a scenario such as D to Z before the original high vowel, then followed by Z to R by romanticization, which doesn't make much sense. It's similar to assume D slash L to R, the latter blocking Bantu spiritualization. And further, anyway, DL to Z to R couldn't explain the Lange situation since in Lange most consonants had never fricated before the high vowels. Table two presents a nice neat picture, uh, but the picture has some rough edges. First, in Lange and Bue, uh, D to R also happened before other vowels, not just the two original high vowels. For example, Dim, which is not the, uh, the highest front vowel, uh, in Lange gives you Rima. Det gives you in Langiretta. It's quite possible this, however, was a, was a knock on. This might have been separate and later. Secondly, it's claimed, Guthrie, Davy, the protobanto GI, GI, G before the high front vowel, also gives R in, in Chaga. There's some doubt about this claim because protobanto reconstructions with G followed by the high front vowel are very few. Guthrie cites no supporting words, and the examples in Davy. Madison and Cole could be reconstructed with consonants other than G. And their discussion of G before the high vowel to R admits that it involves an unproven assumption. But the Lange and the Chagger data do not disprove the basic thesis here. Third, uh, the target languages are just four of the 165 surveyed showing this uncommon rhoticization before the original high vowels. But another, unfortunately, another small distant group shows the same phenomenon. Uh, the P30 languages in Mozambique, uh, the Makua group, so Makua, Chwabo, and so on. Uh, I don't know how to explain this satisfactorily. Uh, Bandification is most often followed by uh, uh, collapsing of the seven vowel system to a five vowel system. Once that happened, L to R also then later occurred allophonically in some East African Bantu languages, a lot of J languages around Lake Victoria. Uh, associate R with front vowels and L with back vowels, but that was a later phenomenon. Fourth and, fourth and finally is the most serious issue of why of D before the high front vowel, why it doesn't rhoticize in Sagana. Um, as can be seen in the tables that I showed before, there's symmetry in rhoticization. But D before the front vowel uh, in Sagala, contrasting with R rhoticized from D before the back vowel, High back vowel is asymmetrical. This does not lend itself to an easy or principled explanation. Several explanations are possible, hard to prove, I would say, rather ad hoc. One might be that Sagara once had the phonetic variety around R that Chaga has today, including a fricative allophone, which exists, which exists in Chaga today, which came to be perceived as Z. Do I believe that? Maybe. Another explanation might be that after D went to R before the high front vowel, that high front vowel lingered, causing frication of the R, which raises the obvious question, well, why only in Sagala in East Africa? I don't know. Yet another explanation might lie in the differential chronology of D before the high front vowel and D before the high back vowel. Maybe D went to R before the high back vowel first, affecting all Chaga, Davi, and Sagala, after which Sagala separated, leaving L unaffected by rhoticization, and it then participated in the usual Eastern Bantu shift to D to Z while the others rhoticized. Those are rather ad hoc explanations. If you have a better one, I'd like to hear it. Um, the second thing that distinguishes RVB is two forms of class 10 as a plural of class 11. Most East African languages form the plural of class 11 and class 10 by prefixing a home organic nasal to the noun stem and adjusting the stem initial consonant, if necessary. So Swahili, u limi, plural limi. Bue, bugwe, lo casa, gives you in casa, uh, with a tone shift. Uh, the target languages have a second technique in a more uh, small, more or less common set of nouns, uh, here labeled 10a. So chaga, uh, that's Western, uh, that's Western chaga. O limi gives you njo limi. Davida uh, Luembe gives you Chwembe. Uh, historical NJ uh, becomes Ch in Davida. 
Some nouns, even adjectives, can form their plural in both ways. So, gueno, uvari, rib, either mbari or njuvari. Davida, lukombe, you either get ngombe or chukombe. In gueno, the second form can even apply to class 10 as the plural of class 9. So, big goats, either buri ndwe or buri njirwe. The best general statement here is that the name of the prefix is applied to the vowel of the class 11 prefix after deleting the consonant. Shapes and details of the prefixation are set out there. I can send you all the references if you want them. The possible shape of a single original nasal consonant is not clear. The most plausible original shape being either ngi or ngi, but obscured by the interaction of ngi and the following u, as in the Gueno examples above. Sagala has the same process, but it has a different initial nasal in many of the same set of nouns. So, um, Sagala, Luzi, string, uh, plural Nuzi, uh, Luaka, voice, plural Nuaka. Um, general Sagala examples, uh, uh, thanks to Martin, Luulu gives you Njuulu, which there's a, G, there's a historical G there. Uh, Luavu, uh, Njavu, there's the original J there. Uh, Luvu um, gives you Njuvu, chameleon. Uh, Lufio, uh, Njufio. Was, that, was a, that, P was an, that F was an original P. Langi and Ju could come from Ju or Njiu, later linking it to Chaga Davida. The available data uh, suggests that this prefix curiously does not exist in Mbugwe. I don't know why not. For several of the Langi examples, mouse shows the regular pre prefix in Mbugwe. So, for example, Langi, Lufio, Jufio, but the plural in Mbugwe uh, is the regular one, Mpio. That's the original P. I interpret this as an innovation that uh, Langi shares with Chaga and Taita. Adjacent Nyaturu and Yaramba show unclear traces. Nyaturu has 11.10 or 11.6. And uh, Vornhoven, with a nice date provided by Martin, mentions and do as a plural of 11. Johnson, 1923, states Nyaramba and Z as a plural of monosyllabic nouns in 11, but provides no examples. Gerard Phillips does point out to me that new, as opposed to ngi or ngu, nye is a typical Sabaki shape, as opposed to n and constant in Davida, Chaga, and Langi. And that some northeast coast boundary lines, at least Swahili, Mijiken, and Komori, also prefix the name, also prefix the name of element to U. So this is not specific to the target language. So Swahili, Uso, Nyuso, Uzi, Nyuzi, Uma, Nyuma. Or in Komorian, uh, Maore, Ulimi, Gulimi, Gulime, sorry, Uso, Guso, Utro, Gutro. I tentatively assume this is having spread at an early point into Sabaki from Taita. Seekers of way or what uh, turning to O, for example, Protobantum Wedi, West and East Kilimanjaro Mweri, Bunjo Mori, Davida, Davida has various dialects. Some have Mweri, some have Mori. Bunjo re recommend, uh, renders a Swahili word Kweli as Koli, because it's a well-known uh, feature amongst Jagger speakers that. Uh, uh, to drink, uh, uh, drink nua gives nyo in Wunjo, but nua in Davida. This affects all Kilimanjaro Bantu, but differentially. The exact form of the rule varies from dialect to dialect. It depends on syllabicity and ordering with other processes such as L deletion. It's most frequent in central Kilimanjaro and Davida, doesn't occur at all in Gueno, despite the Gueno with an E being referred to as by, by others as Vagonu. Bahonu. And in Sagala, it occupies, it occurs in limited morphological environments such as the passive, uh, as in Kikuyu, for example. It also occurs in Langi, but not in Bugwe. So there are uh, all those words here, except the last one, uh, have etymons in Protobantu, so in Bugwe, in Kui, Rangi, in Ko, Shingwe, in Kingo, in Kuya, in Toya, uh, Kurimwi, in Kurimi. Uh, Morere as opposed to Morere. Uh, the, this or a similar process also occurs in Pare and Bugu. Martin says it also occurs in Rift West Cushitica. 
uh, or something similar. The available data, this is a bit confusing, this. Oops, oh, well, don't get confused. The available data shows considerable variation. I feel the current nature of the geographic distribution and the nature of the process in general resembles that of Dahl's law. In case you don't know what Dahl's law is, it's voicing of a voiceless stop before a voiceless consonant in the next syllable. For example, the English word cake is borrowed into Kikuyu as what's written as geki, it's pronounced as reki. Uh, that's actually not the cake that you eat as a dessert. It's um, what cattle eat, it's cattle cake <laughs> in Kikuyu. Dao's law occurs in a full and active form in some, but not all E50 languages, in full form in J30, but only in prefixes in nearby, J, in near, near, nearby J40. The process itself is lost, but has left many traces in many East African Bantu languages. It affects only K in some languages, but P and D in others. Now the resemblance, the general resemblance here is that a phonological process dating back many centuries, even millennia, evolves over time and space. So here the base process, the original process, seems to have been where we are going to O in the original language, heritage or modified in its descendants, showing variability. It can also be transferred to adjacent languages. I would interpret its presence in Pare as a transfer. Open question is whether this was originally transferred from Southern Kushitic. So these are other processes um, which are not directly linked to Rift Valley Banzer, but I just wanted to show you some of the things that I also considered. Uh, the one called here 2D, uh, the pre-nasalized voiceless constant gives, it turns, is subject to an assimilation process, it becomes voice, so Muntu becomes Mundu, happens in Chaga, Dabe, Sagala, not in Langi. It also occurs, occurs in J30 in some E50 languages, but not all. It's universally in southeastern Tanzania and a few neighboring languages. These occurrences are not assumed to be connected to the target languages because I think this is a phonetically natural assimilation process. The reflexive, who? Chaga, um, for example, gi le ku wo na, I passed self C, I saw myself. In, contra in contrast to most surrounding languages, which affects Swahili, which have reflexes of G or Yi, Chaga, David, and Sagala have ku. It also occurs in Pari and Bugu, the traces in Sayuta, for example, Shambaki, uh, uh, Zigua Kwe. Uh, 2F, um, uh, contemporary Chaga has a curious alternation in some words of original high, the high, what were originally the high back vowel and the high front vowel. For example, uh, the root there uh, for root. Uh, which in Purabantu is D, followed by the high front vowel. In some Chaga dialects, it's Mri, in other dialects, is Amru. This is old in Chaga, going back to at least the seven vowel stage. Uh, 27 of the 38 words in a long list in Nurse a long time ago had the original high front vowel E. So it seems to have started many words with that vowel and then spread later, possibly to fewer words, which originally had the high. Um, back vowel and also the mid, uh, high mid uh, front vowel. Chaga shows a few sporadic cases. Um, forget about 2G. Oh, the infinitive. This is the infinitive market in Chaga, unlike most African, uh, East African Bantu languages. Also in Sanjo, uh, F31, Sanyiramba, Nyaturu have several infinitive formatives, including traces of qui which could be interpreted as newer ku, prefix for older e. Uh, it might be noted that F31 and F32 are adjacent to Langi. Um, but Langi has no trace of this, as far as I know. Martin might correct me. Uh, David has no trace of this e, but both, this is rather complicated here, I'll go slowly. Both Chaga and David have forms which might be derived from underlying or historical e. For example, in most Chaga dialects, the word for food is something like Kelia, uh, which probably comes from kya, e, there's the infinitive, ya, a. And the word for drinking water in Davida probably comes from ra, e, the former infinitive, nua, a, which is similar in structure to, uh, to Swahili, chakula, cha, ku, the infinitive, l, a. These bits and pieces suggest that e might have had a wider distribution once in that area of East Africa. Otherwise, East Africa 
has no signs of an infinitive marker uh, in, uh, in class five. Uh, Jagger has a unique negative system, a, cis, a set of post-verbal clitics, most fully seen today in Gueno, if Gueno is still alive. Uh, so, the rendi ni, I went not. Who rendi fo, you went not. A rendi rogonu we, he to Gueno not. Fule ruhi nyama fuyathame, we didn't buy meat in Thame. So you can see that the infinitive is at the end. It's a post-verbal clitic. Um, it's not a post, it's not a post sentence. It's not a uh, sentence, se sentence final. It's, it's a post-verbal. The first singular, third singular, first plural, second plural forms are identical to or only minimal different, diff minimally different from the corresponding self-standing pronouns. Two singular and third plural are, and the other noun classes are negated by the pronoun plus the O of reference. How this arose in the beginning is not clear. It seems to have been the original Jagger system since reduced traces of it ex exist in some other dialects and not just Gueno. In the 1970s, when uh, I was there, older speakers could still produce more or less complete uh, fragments of the Gueno system. I doubt they can today, perhaps. A few East African Bantu lines, especially southeastern Tanzania, mark primary negatives by a post-verbal element, but none of them derive from the pronouns as here. Uh, I said at the beginning I wouldn't talk about this, but here it is. Tagas devoice all fricatives, which resulted from Bantu frication. Uh, devoicing has not occurred in Langi, Osagara, or Davida. It occurs in East Africa, especially in southeastern Tanzania and Bantu, and some adjacent languages. Um, Okay, the next one, uh, T voicing intervocalically. For some decades, it was assumed that the vo intervocalic voicing of T to D was one of the central features linking and defining Chaga to Davida. Davida and some Chaga dialects still have D, while other dialects have moved on to varieties of R. Parts of different Kilimanjaro went further and moved on to voices continuants, so H and Siha. The voices you go aspirant and aspirant in Matyame. A wider sp perspective shows a different view, uh, that, that this is not one of the original features linking Chaga and Davida. Not only Sagala and Langi, but also North Rombo, East Kilimanjaro, did not move to D, retaining T in some shape or other, and South Rombo only has D before contemporary high vowels. This all suggests that the voicing of T to D was not a proto Kilimanjaro band or even a proto Chaga innovation but developed only later in Gueno, Central Kilimanjaro, and maybe West Kilimanjaro, only moving recently into Rombo, but never reaching the North Rombo. But it occurs also uh, in Davida. Multiplicity liquids. I'm, so, I'm very struck by this, so I, I stuck this in. Davy, uh, Madison and co. list 11 phonetic liquids and four, possibly five, phonemic liquids for one dialect alone. <laughs> Uh, my data for 1979, Phillips and his other data supporting this, suggests that this abundance may also characterize much of the rest of Chaga, but not Gueno, but this suggests it's a post proto Chaga feature. Multiple object markers. Contrary to most other language, language which allow only one object marker or two, at most two, Chaga allows up to five in a string. Multiple markers are also allowed in Pare, Bugu, and Seuta. So, for example, in Bugu, He, Ne, Za, Hu, Shawa, they will be suffering for sure. So, the underlined bits on the left correspond very roughly to the meanings on the right, the underlined meanings on the right. And Shamba, Ni, Za, Ha, Ka, Mu, Mu, Itanga, I sometimes used to call her to no purpose, if anybody would ever say that. Chaga has a verb initial Ni. Uh, which often assimilates vowel drops, and then you get an assimilated nasal, associated most obviously with focus, associated with positive verbs, not, not, not negative verbs. So, Gueno, ni, huo wa, rodeira, ni, we are cooking for them. If you put that in the negative, the ni would disappear. It also occurs in E50 languages and J42 on the eastern side of Lake Victoria as what is termed focus. Uh, in J30 on the eastern side of Lake Victoria, 
as ne, the vowel lowering, which is labeled as if, and in some J10 and 20 languages, around Lake Victoria is progressive. It's generally interpreted as an innovation arriving from the Cochrane in the geographical origin unknown, but its current distribution would point to the center somewhere north of, west or north of Kilimanjaro. Uh, finally, um, the main negative in Segala prefixes S to the affirmative. So, T, Shahia, we will love. Negative, C, T, Shahia. T, Gulile gives you C, Gulile. This innovation is most uh, easily interpreted as originating in the negative copula, B, not, or just not, the kind of process that might occur in pigeonization. Apparently spreads easily, occurring in Langi, but not in Bugu, uh, Gogo, but not adjacent Kaguru, and most G60 languages. I'm not sure if it's most or all. Langi is adjacent to Gogo, which in turn is adjacent to most of several G60 languages. All are spoken not too far from Sagala. Well, depends what you consider not too far. And it seems possible that its presence in Sagala in these languages is not a coincidence. Is this common spread on Yanja? Or, or, or is, it, is this common origin or spread? It also occurs in N30, which is in Yanja. This is, a, this is unreadable for you. So what I did was I put, I put all those features, I tried to cram them into one page which makes it uh, unreadable. Um, so the first, the, but they, they're essentially divided into five groups. These things on the left, 2A, 2B, and 2D, are the features which define uh, um, Rift Valley Bantu. And then there's another group which define um, Chaga and Davida, uh, uh, Chaga and Sagala, and another group which define Chaga and so on. So um, that's just a, uh, an attempt to put those into one table. And I've summarized this now. Let's just pass on to the next one. So table three, that's a horrible table. That divides the features into seven, into five sets. The first set, rhodocization, uh, class 10A, plural, and the way what going to O, Special rhodocization is crucial to pro rift valley Brantu. Brantu. Rhodocization must have been early, preceding Brantification itself, preceding the change of seven to five vowels and fricative devoicing. Development of, of uh, 10a as a plural of 11 must also have been early, assuming it spread most plausibly from Taita into Sabaki and Swahili. It would then have been carried thence across to the Comoro Islands. The exact date of this linguistic settlement of the Comoro Islands is not clear, but is likely to have been a millennium, millennium or longer ago. Uh, that's the most recent, recent. Bucato is the most recent historical article I found on that. The second set um, defines Kilimanjaro Bantu uh, after the separation from Langi. The third set defines Chaga and Davida after Sagala broke away. The fourth set defines just Chaga. Possibly infinitive uh, uh, in class five was also, as I mentioned, a Davida feature. You can't really judge that very well. Um, two, what, uh, the voicing of T doesn't occur in all of Chaga, so almost post state proto Chaga, but it's curiously shared with Davida. The fifth set doesn't define any grouping, but I put it in here for different reasons, um, but mainly questions. How and why did the extraordinary collection of liquids in Kilimanjaro, but not Gueno, develop? Permitting four or even five pre-stem markers in a row from Chaga and Gueno, Pare, Bugu, and Ceuta, is the most dramatic instance of an innovative aerial feature that has spread, even though its origin is uncertain. I would guess it's probably goes in this direction, Chaga, Davida, to Pare, to Mbugu, to Ceuta. Similarly, how to explain the con con contemporary distribution of this knee focus progressive, which links Lat Chaga, but not the other languages, to languages to its north and west. In general, those languages to its north and west are ph phonologically conservative, whereas this is a shared innovation. Finally, the distribution of the innovation negative C from the negative copula is puzzling in a different way. 
It occurs in Langi, adjacent to Gogo, adjacent to the G60 languages. So it originally probably originated one of those and spread to the others. But how to explain a second independent innovation in Sagala, which is only 350 kilometers across the steppe and also in Yanja? I don't know. There are some obvious flaws in what proceeds. One flaw has to do with explaining phonology. Why does do before the high back vowel, or why did do d before the high back vowel, but not d before the high front vowel, undergo rhodicization in Sagala as might be expected? Uh, in Sagala, why is rhodicization apparently unsystematic? G before the high front vowel being apparently affected by rhodicization, but not G before the high back vowel, not key before the high front vowel, not key K before the high back vowel. And why does class A, why do class A, why in class 10A do most of the languages concerned have reflexes in G on G, which is somewhat obscured by the interaction of the vowel I and the following U, whereas Sagala has the palatal nasal here. Both shapes be replicated in some Sabaki languages. I don't know. A more common flaw is explaining the geographical distribution of features. Some features can be explained. Once um, this hypothetical proto Rift Valley Bantu split up long ago, Langi, Kilimanjaro, Bantu were no longer much in touch because the intervening dry steppe was a barrier to communication, uh, not a congenial place for farmers as Martin mentioned to me. So it would be natural that Langi and its neighbours, Yatura and um, Yaramba, on the western side of the steppe would start to share features in both directions. Uh, just as features present in Kilimanjaro Bantu on the eastern side of the steppe would then be shared with its neighbours on the eastern side. There was an obvious linguistic corridor from Kilimanjaro through the Pari Mountains of the Usambaras, the latter part of a triangle with the coast and the Taita Hills. Along that corridor, there must have been plenty of bilinguals. Uh, but why does rhodicization also occur in Makua and other uh, P30 languages in Mozambique? Spoke 100, uh, 1,500 kilometers south of Kilimanjaro and not particularly otherwise linked to the RVB group. Why does Chagas share the very specific infinitive mark in class 5 with Sanjo, located in the middle of the steppe to its west, and with which Chaga is not in other ways closely related. The distribution of the striking innovative negative market C in Sagala and Langi, Gogo, uh, G60, 350 miles, 350 kilometers to the west today, and even far away in Yanja, remains to be explained, as does a spilling over of 10A down to the coast uh, across the Comoro Islands. Likewise, it's hard to imagine that the innovation of the verb initial ni happened, happened separately in Kilimanjaro, Central Kenya, and Lake Victoria. And there's little else to suggest that these particular language or groups of languages share a common ancestor. Other shared processes are less specific and more general, but also hard to explain. So the voicing of pre nasalized voiceless stops or the voicing of fricatives, devoicing of fricatives. You find Kilimanjaro Bantu, but they also incurred in other groups not far away. Is this a natural process or inheritance from a shared ancestor? Did Bantu frication and spiritization happen just once in East Africa or at several times and places? Such puzzles are not limited to the language being considered. This is one of my favorite puzzles. In coastal northern Swahili, so northern Kenya and, and uh, Somalia, Anterior stroke perfect aspect is represented by the almost universal Bantu suffix ile. But in uh, coastal, uh, historical coastal southern Swahili, which is almost dead now, and Comorian, ile doesn't appear at all. It's replaced by the vowel copy suffix. So the verb kupata, tupata means we have got. Leta, kuleta, tulete means we have brought. Uh, tulimi, we have hold. To Ono, to Lumu, etc. How to explain that the nearest languages of this suffix are spoken nearly 2,000 kilometers to the west? How can that be? So, final paragraph. Uh, Bantu communities have been in East Africa for nigh on two millennia, a crowded linguistic scene, mixing, converging, diverging, migrating, changing, developing, overlapping, 
often with bio-multilingual individuals. Some middle-sized communities in the areas have waned. We got a bit of nice biblical stuff in here. Some middle-sized communities in the area have waned. So, for example, Gueno, 250 years ago, was a large community. Buboy was a larger 100 years ago, apparently, than it is now. Some tiny communities have vanished or are van vanishing. So, Kahe, out in the steppe, south of Kilimanjaro in Russia, while others known to be accommodating to outsiders have waxed, being the opposite of waned. Sukuma and Yamwez in Iraq are accommodating to outsiders. If this has happened in the last two or three centuries, how much could have happened in the last two millennia? Large water site, large water type sets of features needed to, need to define a historic set of languages are not the norm, and it's proved very hard to find them. So basing a clade such as RVB on just three features seems to me to be acceptable. Uh, those are references. Thanks so much for your presentation. We can now begin the question and answer section. The question and answer section will be open to voice questions as well as written questions. If you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand in the nonverbal controls present underneath the participant panel, and I will send you a request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question, that is also still possible. You can do so using the Zoom chat module, and as usual, I will read out the question. Please remember that the webinars are recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. Martin? Uh, thank you, Derek. I, uh, of course, I agree with uh, a lot that you say. Um, I, what I presented also in Rift Valley Network is uh, in just similar that um, the Rangi has uh, dear links to, to Chaga. I think you make it much more precise than I could do because I also saw a lot of uh, um, correspondences with Pare, but that, that must be then influenced from those cases with Ch uh, Chaga spread to, to Pare. Um, and uh, I, I propose to relate it to the to the history of of the the clans that uh, you have an enormous influx in in Rangi of clans from Yatukudo, and then in uh, because people uh, see these words uh, in the, in the original Chaka clade language and and the difference in Yatulu language as uh, similar enough uh, to uh, to have. Now and again, very few cases, uh, uh, both reflexes um, uh, next to each other, but then sometimes one wins over the other. Um, so just a few, yeah, thoughts, I, remarks, I don't know. I was, uh, you asked about the E infinitive. I, I can't find it in Rangi, but Rangi has, Langi has uh, uh, some constructions with a, um, in a bare infinitive, that's the closest I can offer to you, mm -hmm. which is uh, the and on the book where you asked about that, and I I'm not so sure whether uh, Mbukwe and Langi uh, share that because in a number of cases uh, Mbukwe doesn't go. You 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 also mentioned them doesn't go with Langi, so mm -hmm. so 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 maybe uh, M Mbukwe. Uh, is uh, is is a different uh, merger of of line of, of of Bantu. And the final negation is there in 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 uh, Langi and Bukwe, but then from a very different source. So I guess that that happens independently. Uh, whether we we can see any pressure from nearby language structural pressure to to want something final in negation i don't know but but uh, in rangi buku it's uh, tuku i think from maasai uh, meaning at all as a as something that um, emphasizes uh, that that then developed into a negative marker mm -hmm. but uh, but 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 maybe if we look at the distribution it's something i uh, i was thinking about of of uh, verb final negation marker across 
It happened several times in East Africa, but that uh, geographical distribution gives us some uh, suggestions, maybe, I don't know. But I loved your talk. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question in the chat. It has two parts, so I'll read the first part and then the second part after you've answered the first part. Um, how do you define prefix E as originating from noun class five? I'm not sure. In, in Sanjo, which is the other language which has this, that is the class five marker. Uh, in Chaga, that's a good question. If you could put that in writing, I'll check on that. I, I'll have to look across uh, Chaga and see what the class five marker is, since class five markers vary quite a lot. I'll, uh, in Sanjo, I'm sure uh, that it's class five. I, I, I guess I just assumed because it was class five in Sanjo, it would also be the same thing in Chaga, but I can check on that. Thank you, yes, I'll, I'll check on that. And then the second part of the question was, how do you relate this prefix with E or A as locative prefix in like Victoria languages? Sure, I was aware it was a locative marker in, in J languages. Well, but that's, I, I mean, what's cool exactly? Is cool class 15 infinitive? Is that the same as class 50, uh, class 17 locative? Yes, I, I, I've always assumed it is. Uh, so possibly this could be a locative marker too. Uh, yes, why not? Um, uh, whoever sent me this, give me some exa send me some examples in in, <laughs> in in J languages, in Victoria languages. I, I have a look. That's an interesting, oh, interesting question that. Go ahead, Andrew. I should say, um, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, in, in Ihanzu as well, and, that, and, and, and that's consistent with, with Nilamba and Yaturu, we get a lot of um, uh, infinitive forms that seem to be a combination of, of, uh, of, of, a, of a ku and an e. I always thought that that e would have been reflexive because the reflexive marker is e in, in Ihanzu as well. So we get this key rather than ku in some uh, forms. And I've always had it as a, as, a, as a little list of things to do to try and get a form without the e and to see if there was, you know, a, a meaning behind the verb that was that I could tease apart. Maybe there were other forms, but this uh, this uh, e as, a, as an infinitive is really interesting. But that's not my question. My question, well, I guess, yeah, my question is, I, I, and this kind of rides a bit on what Martin had said, some of, um, uh, some of these distinctions, these very clear and systematic distinctions between uh, Mbugwe and Rangi are very surprising to me because I've always sort of been, you know, been tricked into thinking, okay, well, these are just the same language and, and we get some very recent uh, differences, but these seem to be rather more um, extensive and systematic than what I would have thought. Do we have any sort of historical thoughts on what the what the scenario was for that? Yeah. That isn't the question for me, that's a question for Martin. Oh, um, speculation. Uh, but um, the, the book with that, they have uh, quite specific um, traditions that when they uh, arrived there, that there was an agricultural group already in place. Um, not, of course, there's no idea what kind of language they would, would have spoken. Um, there is uh, uh, the, Rang the Rangi and the Bukwe, they, uh, they both, they have the feeling that their languages are close. Um, yet the, 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 there's many, many, many uh, uh, differences but uh, uh, roughly half of the clans are shared between the Rangi and the Bukwe. So there's been a lot of, uh, yeah, uh, mixing of populations uh, in, in the latest uh, centuries. On both the Rangi and the Mbukwe side, I would assume. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So the, I the idea of the of the Mbukwe and of the Langi is that that uh, the movement for the, was from uh, north to south, uh, but clearly uh, that is uh, of in their origin stories. I mean, there clearly seem to be also movement later. 
the, the, old, the as oldest tradition of uh, salt seeking parties from Langi to Mbukwe to look for salt. Some left, some stayed behind. So yeah, I think it's in both directions. Yeah, this uh, that's really interesting, and obviously makes makes perfect sense. The idea of these salt seeking uh, parties, and of course, it rhymes with some of the stuff that we've been uh, poking at uh, in uh, with the Lake Easi uh, and Sukuma people moving back and forth between yeah. Lake Easi. Uh, looking for salt and everything that could be uh, involved in that. So that's nice. I like that. It goes back to uh, salt again. I've just uh, checked for the class five subject marker in Ihanzu, and I have it written down here in my database as li. So there's an E there, but not a high E. Uh, but that could maybe, maybe, um, maybe Stan has a, has a better, uh, has a better characterization there. Uh, but thank you for, for that, both of you. Just one thing there. I I shared the same assumption as you. I mean, Langi is not a language I, I knew much, too much about until I started this, uh, and I just assumed as you did because you know, one's called F thirty three and the other one's called F thirty four. You know, you would assume that they would be very similar. I was constantly struck by the differences between them. So I I, I have no systematic view of of the similarities and the differences between them, but. Uh, as Martin says, there's obviously something more than we think going on there. I'm not sure what it is. Bonnie, you want to go ahead? Thanks for your talk, Derek. It's early morning here too, so I think I I, I wasn't following everything as well as I should have. But I was looking up uh, papers on roticization because you were talking about some of the irregular roticization. I found that interesting. But what it seems like is that that is pretty common for you know say within romance or you know there's a lot of mm -hmm. i guess i i wouldn't worry too much yeah. about it not being because that seems to be almost the norm <laughs> whether i'm looking what? at uh, a mandarin chinese roticism or romance roticism people are trying to get a handle on why it seems to be lexically specific at times or you know not having you know quite the distribution one would expect but if it's not occurring with e but it is with u i would worry there might be an ele or some more name that it is sort of blocking it and that there's mm. no the change isn't happening due to some analogy or something that would be my suggestion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i was aware of it, in romance i was aware of that um but i didn't think it relevant to mention it Oh, Tom, yes. Well, um, coming back to the infinitive marker and then possibly that uh, uh, evolves to a larger question. I mean, the, the E infinitive marker is a widespread feature in, in Western Bantu, so it's much older. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I was, uh, I, I don't want to generalize uh, over all your um, isoglosses or, or, or features, but I was wondering um, whether you checked that some features actually could be remnants of an early layer of Bantu, which was submerged by uh, later Im immigration. And then, of course, that's not an innovation, but rather a re retention. And, and so yeah. I, I'm a bit, I was asking myself your large list of features uh, you tend or you want to interpret interpret them as innovations in order to define a clade. But the question is, of course, could some of them be retentions? Could some of them be typologically unmarked, like roticization? Uh, you know that, that that's uh, I was a bit worried about this general uh, uh, problem. Oh, I like that. Uh, I, when I first saw it. Uh, uh, in the 70s, you know, I was aware that it was a Western Bantu feature in Western Bantu. And so my original thought was, this is a retained feature, uh, not an innovation. Um, and I still I actually think that Chaga, as always, as I mentioned, has always posed a classificatory problem. I mean, Guthrie only put it in zone E because he thought he couldn't think of anywhere better to put it. That's not any kind of argument at all. I've always thought of Chaga as a kind of isolate. Um, now, an isolate could be something that came in or something that was there before. I'm not quite sure which. Um, uh, so I would agree with you, yes. I would, I, I would I would think of this as a retained feature rather than an innovative feature. If I mention the word innovation, I retract that. 
I would say, a, a, a retained feature. Yeah. But then, uh, but you know, if it if it is a retention, then it cannot possibly qualify as a defining feature of a clade, of a uh, new of a new clade. So I mean that that's a little bit, you know, the interpretation uh, to mm -hmm. say you have a new. Um, um, you know, node in a family tree, if it's defined by retention sets, uh, mm -hmm. well, I don't think that works uh, according to traditional historical linguistics. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, I have to think about that, yes. I have just a very small, simple question. I was curious about the repeated object marking and what all of the bits we're doing in the examples. And so I guess I was just curious how all of those are are objects. I'm not familiar with these constructions, so I don't know how they work. Um, it occurred to me, uh, as I put those down, I'm not familiar, Martin's more familiar with Bungu, I don't know about Shamba, um, that since Chaga allows this, Pari allows this, Bungu allows this, Shamba allows this, it would be meaningful to look at um, the order of these and which ones allow and in what order. I, I don't have any uh, insight into that. I'm just aware of it as a, as a general feature. What was your question again? I just wasn't sure what all of these markers were doing, that it looks like some of it is more tense and aspect than it is object marking, but maybe I don't understand the examples. Oh, yes, there's a contradiction there. Multiple object markers in line one and 10 and markers in line two. You're right. Uh, it, it shouldn't be multiple object markers. It should be multiple tense aspect markers. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. But Buku and Shamba, they, they do allow uh, multiple object markers. Markers as well, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it doesn't go wild in Bugu, in, I think a bit more in Shamba, but I think, yeah. that, but but not for these ones. The here in Bugu, uh, the Ku and this, the Ne and the, and the Za are uh, tense aspect markers. Ku probably. Um, um, yeah. What's the Ku? What's the Ku? I don't know for sure, but um, I think what you have is uh, if if you if you are a bilingual in. Uh, in Bantu languages, then uh, if your mother tongue allows multiple objects, then you feel free to do that also in the other Bantu language. Mm. I think that's mm -hmm. what's mm -hmm. going on. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm reluctant. I, I, I accept that. Yeah, obviously, it should be tense aspect markers. Well, probably should say object markers slash tense aspect markers, since it appears to be both. Um, I'm reluctant to get into that. This is not directly relevant to, to my main point here about uh, Rift Valley Brown to, um, because getting into that would be, I'd have to look into that and I don't, I don't have the library resources or the resources to look into. Uh, that would be very complicated. <laughs> Thank you. I think those are all of the questions and comments for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinars series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page, and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. I would like to thank Derek again for his presentation and everyone else for participating today, and I hope to see you again at our next webinar.